you talked earlier about uh, the training you need to do to maintain your peace officer's license, correct? Yes. And as a Minneapolis police officer, you know, where do you get that training from? Um, well, we'll get it from um, our training um, unit. Um, we'll also get it from outside sources, uh, uh, you know, different schools that are being put on, um, some that are specific to homicide, uh, some that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, a one-day course, some may be a two-week course, that kind of thing. Does that training uh, include instruction on the use of force? Yes. And how often do you get instruction on the use of force? Uh, once a year. And how many officers have to go through that use of force training every year? Uh, every officer on the police department. That includes the guy who's number one in seniority? That includes me, yes, absolutely. And when you... Um, well, let me ask it this way. Are there also Minneapolis Police Department policies about the use of force? Yes, there is. And are you required to be familiar with those policies? Yes, you are. And when you do that use of force training, does it cover um, the policies as well? Yes. Do you also do some physical activity, taking people down and rolling around? Yes, we, we uh, have a mat that we use at our SOC center and um, it's uh, um, like a huge wrestling mat. And um, are you familiar with the use of force continuum? Yes. Is that part of the Minneapolis Police Department use of force policy? Yes, it is. Can you just describe in general what that means to the jurors? Yeah, so basically the use of force continuum is um, guidelines, uh, or it's policy actually, uh, that we have to follow. And it's um, when, uh, for instance, when you arrive at a scene, no matter what the scene, um, the first level, the lowest level, would be just your presence at a scene uh, in uniform. Um, the next uh, step up uh, may be your, your uh, verbal um, skills that you would that you've learned to de help diffuse a situation or, or learn information about whatever the situation is um, the next step would be like a soft um, a soft technique um, escorting the person by their arm um, th that type of thing the next level would be a hard technique that's where you would use your uh, uh, you know, you maybe have to use your mace or uh, handcuffs, um, that kind of thing. And finally, the, the top um, uh, level on the continuum is uh, deadly force. And so those levels change, you know, how, under, under what, or for what reasons might that change? Yeah, well, um, if you're, uh, say you arrive at a scene and somebody's pointing a gun at you or shooting at you, of course you go to the top level, you know? Um, uh, and, and that's how they may change. So it's relative to the threat. Right, yes. And um, are there different kinds of force that officers can use? Yes. And, um, have you ever, in all the years you've been working for the Minneapolis Police Department, um, been trained to kneel on the neck of someone who is handcuffed behind their back in a prone position? No, I haven't. Is that, if that were done, would that be considered force? Absolutely. What level of force might that be? That would be the top tier, the deadly force. Why? Because of... Uh, the fact that um, if, if your knee is on a person's neck, that can kill them. And in your training with the, with the Minneapolis Police Department uh, over the years, have you received training on restraining people? Yes. 
uh, including the use of handcuffs. Yes. And when you are handcuffing somebody, when you handcuff them, what is your responsibility as an officer with regard to that person? Um, d d well, d d could I give you an example? Um, okay. Um, wow. Let me ask you this um, again. If, if you, as an officer, according to the training, you handcuff somebody behind the back, what's your responsibility with regard to that person from that moment on? Um, that person is yours. Um, he's your responsibility. Uh, his safety is your responsibility. Uh, his well-being and uh, is your responsibility. Once you handcuff somebody, does that affect the amount of force uh, that you should consider using? Absolutely. How so? Um, once a person is cuffed, um, the the threat level goes down all the way. You know, to uh, they're cuffed. How can they really hurt you? You know, um, and uh, well, certainly there could be circumstances when. A cuffed person could still be combative. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. But you getting injured is way down. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, if you're, uh, you could have some guy try to kick you or something, um, but you can move out of the way. That person is handcuffed, you know, and they, um, um, the, the, the threat level is just not there. So by handcuffing somebody, you've taken away some of their ability to harm you. Absolutely. And if somebody who is handcuffed um, becomes less combative, does that change the amount of force that an officer is to use under policy? Yes. How so? Um, well, if, if they become less combative, um, you, uh, you may just have them sit down on a curb. Or um, uh, the idea is to calm the person down. And if they are not a threat to you at that point, you try to, um, uh, you know, to, to um, uh, help them um, so that they're not as upset as, as uh, they may have been in the beginning. In your you know, 30 years of training with the Minneapolis Police Department and your experience, have you been trained on um, the prone position? Yes. And what has your training been specific to the prone position? Well, once, um, once you secure or handcuff a person, um, you need to get them out of the prone position as soon as possible because it restricts their breathing. When you handcuff somebody behind their back, well, as part of training, have you been handcuffed behind the back? Yes. And have you been trained on what happens to individuals when they're handcuffed behind the back? Yes. So when somebody is handcuffed behind their back, how does it affect them physically? It, it stretches the muscles back through your chest, and it makes it more difficult to uh, breathe. If you put somebody in the prone position, well, is it well known, this danger of putting somebody in the prone position? This is dangerous. How long have you had training on the dangers of the prone position as part of a Minneapolis police officer? Um, for, um, since I, 1985. And uh, is it part of your training regularly regularly to learn about uh, keeping somebody in the prone position? Yes. And what has the training been with regard to the prone position? Once a person is cuffed, uh, you need to turn them on their side or have them sit up. Um, you need to get them off their chest. Why? Because of the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, your muscles are pulling back when you're handcuffed. 
And if you're laying on your chest, that's constricting your breathing even more. In your training uh, as a Minneapolis police officer, are you uh, provided with training on medical intervention? Yes. I assume you're not you know, taught to be paramedics, but you receive some level of training. Yeah, uh, we're first responders, I think, is what our category would be. Does that include doing what we think of as CPR, chest compressions? Yes. And how often is that part of your training? Um, CPR, uh, it's like every other year or so. And as part of your training within the Minneapolis Police Department policies, uh, is there an obligation to provide medical intervention when necessary? Absolutely. What is the general teaching that you get uh, with regard to medical intervention? Well, again, it, um, it's been that you need to uh, provide uh, medical care for a person that is in distress. And would that be true even if you've called an ambulance to come to the scene? Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, the ambulance will um, get there in whatever amount of time. And in that time period, you need to provide um, uh, 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 medical uh, assistance um, uh, before they arrive. So, Lieutenant Zimmerman, um, I want to draw your attention back to the incidents on May 25th of 2020. Yes. Earlier, you told the jurors about being at yeah, being at the scene, finishing your work there. Um, the next day, did you have an opportunity to review some video of that incident? Yes. And do you recall what that video, where you saw it? Yes. And was it the, we've been calling the Dar Darnella Frazier video? Yes. Did you watch that video in its entirety? Yes, I did. And since then, have you had an opportunity to watch other video of the incident? Yes. And specifically, have you watched uh, body-worn camera video of the incident from the involved officers? Yes. And based on that uh, and your years of training, and experience with the Minneapolis Police Department, um, you saw Officer, then Officer Chauvin, with his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, correct? Yes. Would you call what you saw there a use of force? Yes. And did that use of force continue until the ambulance arrived? Yes, it did. Was there any change in the level of force being used until the ambulance arrived? No. And what do you think about that use of force during that time period? I'm sorry? What do you think about that use of force during that time period? I'm going to answer that question. Uh, a little vague. Could you uh, li limit it to uh, the time frame? Right. Okay. So um, based on your review of the body-worn camera videos of the incident. Yes. And directing your attention you know, to that moment when Mr. Floyd is placed on the ground. Yes. Um, what is your, uh, you know, your view of that use of force during that time period? Totally unnecessary. What do you mean? Um, well, first of all, um, pulling him down to the ground face down and putting your knee on a neck for that amount of, uh, that amount of time is just... Um, uncalled for. Um, it, I saw no reason why the officers felt they were in danger, if that's what they felt. Um, and that's what they would have to feel to be able to use that kind of force. So in your opinion, should that restraint have stopped once he was handcuffed and prone on the ground? Absolutely. And. I should add to that question then, also that it appeared he had stopped resisting. I'm sorry? And it appeared that he had stopped putting up any resistance. Absolutely, I would stop. I have nothing further, Gar.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.